Good morning, precious people of God. Welcome to another Sunday morning that the Lord has allowed us to see. Thank you so much for your presence this morning and another Facebook broadcast of our message from my home. I'm Pastor Pillard, Pastor of Fort Washington Baptist Church, where we have some of the most wonderful saints this side of heaven. I'm delighted to be with you again today. The Lord is good, and he is worthy of all of our praise. Let's take a moment, let's have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to uh, let you hear a song. I'll give you some background on the song before we do so. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for life and health and strength today. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the peace that you give to us. Thank you for watching over in us, for keeping us in your care, for the abundance of your provisions, for your mercies which are new each and every day. Bless our time today in this period of singing and worship and sharing of the word of God and partaking of the Holy Communion. Be glorified in all that is done. We avail ourselves completely to you. In the wonderful name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Why don't you give the Lord some praise right where you are. Take a moment, stand, and give the Lord some praise. <laughs> Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to let you uh, hear a song that was written by our very own uh, brother, Fred Dindy. Um, it was published and distributed back in um, 2004. Um, Joy Fox, who had been with us for a period of time, very, very lovely vocalist is singing um, on the track. And, and the song actually won national recognition um, in 2016 in the USA Songwriting Competition, To God Be the Glory. So won't you take a moment, let's enjoy Here I Am, written by Brother Dindy, being sung by Sister Joy Fox. God bless you, love you.
Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Brother Dindy, for allowing us to use that track this morning. At the end of our message, we'll hear another track from that CD that was produced by Brother Fred Dindy. Uh, and that song is titled Psalm 98. And uh, Precious Joy Fox will be singing on that one as well. So we just thank the Lord for the gifts that he gives our brothers and sisters and their willingness to share their gifts with the body of Christ. Let's pray once more. Father, thank you now for this chance to share the word of God with the people of God. Use me today for your glory. Let every heart be encouraged. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, welcome to our broadcast. Um, again, I'm Pastor Pilar. For you were with us for the first time and your presence today is greatly appreciated. Good morning to each and every one of you. And if you would, be so kind um, to press your share button on Facebook uh, so that people who are in your timeline might also be able to enjoy the message with us today. Uh, just press share and, and, and let them uh, be blessed also by the Word of God. Amen. Today's message is the ninth uh, from Peter's letter to suffering saints um, in Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, Asia, Bithynia, and Pontus. Um, this is the ninth message in the series that I've titled Encouraging Suffering Saints. Lord, bless your word as it goes out. And be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 2, which is where I've been the last two weeks, uh, Peter encouraged the saints by reminding them that they were called to be like Christ. At verse 21 again of chapter 2, verse 21, he writes, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return, while suffering he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Uh, I'm going to share a few things with you today. Um, that might sound redundant from last week, but I want to add a few other things to the points that I bring out um, that I just want to uh, make sure I don't skip anything that's substantive um, as we go through these verses. Uh, and, and those verses I just read, 21 through 25, again, uh, Peter encourages the saints by reminding them that Christ left them an example for them to follow that they were to be ultimately, if you will, like the Lord Jesus. Christ, if you remember from the scriptures, suffered. How? At the hands of others who did what? Who martyred him, who killed him. And in his suffering at the hands of others, the way he handled it, Christ left us an example to follow. He was reviled or verbally abused but did not revile in return. They verbally assaulted Jesus, but he never verbally assaulted back. No sin or deceit was ever in his mouth. And while being verbally abused and suffering at the hands of others, Jesus uttered no threats. They were condemning him and humiliating him and slandering him and accusing him and beating on him, and spat upon him, and whipped him, and mocked him, and put thorns on his head, caused him all kinds of grave suffering, and Jesus never uttered a single threat, never sought to get even harbored, no feelings of ill will, and the whole while they're abusing him, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, knowing that that one would ultimately judge those who were causing his suffering. He allowed them to kill him, 
to bear our sins so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness. And even though we were continually strained like sheep, he never closed the door on us coming back to him. You and I as saints in Christ have been called to follow the example of Christ, to never verbally abuse those who verbally abuse us, to have no sin or deceit in our mouth, to never live seeking to get even or retribution, that even when mistreated, to harbor no ill will or ill feelings toward those who cause our suffering. And, and in the midst of being mistreated, to keep entrusting ourselves to God, keep turning to God, keep leaning on God, no matter what they're doing to us, we keep entrusting ourselves to God. And when those who have been abusing us and mistreating us, when they, those who have gone astray from the will of the Lord and how they engage us, when they humbly repent, turn to us and ask for forgiveness, we are to never close the door, but allow them to come back as the Lord has allowed each of us to come back. Jesus set for us an example to follow. And if we are ever going to live up to that standard of Christ, I shared with you several things have to happen. And the first one was, or is, that saints are not only called to follow Christ, we're going to do it, saints are called to grow. And how do we grow? What enables us to grow? The first thing I showed you was that we have to let some things go. At verse 1 of chapter 2, Peter writes, therefore, putting aside all malice, We've got to let that go, all desires to hurt someone, that's what that is. And all guile, that's deceit or lies. We've got to let that go, misleading others through lies. And hypocrisy, that's living a lie. We've got to let that go. And all envy, that pain that people feel at the progress and prosperity of others, we've got to let that go. And all slander, ruining of others' reputations without tongues. We've got to let that go. No matter what they've done, we are not to ruin their reputation in the eyes of others with our mouth. Let all of that slander go. No longer are we to long for these things in our lives. We ought to put them off, take them off like clothing, set them aside. If we're going to grow, we've got to let some things go. And if we're going to grow... We have to long for it, not to get even with anyone, but we've got to long for the word of God. He says at verse 2, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, by the pure milk of the word, you may grow. How? And respect the salvation. In other words, you cannot grow and respect the salvation without the pure milk of the word. And then he closes by saying, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, if you've tasted his goodness in the word of God, his kindness, all the things he's chosen us for, taste it. And you'll see that it's marvelously good, it's deliciously good. If you've tasted the good milk of the word, as you've encountered the goodness of the Lord in the word of God, long for more of it like a baby longs for milk. No milk for babies mean no growth. No word for Christians mean no growth. If you and I are going to grow, it is only through the word of God. And as you grow, you know babies start off with milk. It is not too long. They need something more substantive. And then before long, they got teeth and they're chewing. And then they want meat and everything else. As you grow in the word of God, your appetite increases. Milk not only milk pleases, but it doesn't sustain you at some point. You want more than milk. You want milk and the meat of the word. As you grow, your appetite for the word of God begins to grow. And so I asked you this question last week. How do you know when a saint is growing in respect to salvation? And I shared with you what the Lord put in my spirit. You know by their honesty about the things they need to let go of. You know you're growing. When you can be honest and say, you know what? The area that I'm really struggling with is malice. 
I've got to learn how to let that go. No, the area I'm struggling with is deceit. I don't know why I can't stop telling lies. Or the, the area I'm struggling with is hypocrisy. There's always someone I'm putting on another face to impress. I've got to get to the place where I'm at peace with how the Lord made me. I don't want to live a lie no more. I've got to be honest about this. You know, you, you, when, you, when you can admit I'm struggling with envy, looking at the prosperity of others and the progress of others, hurts my own heart about things that I don't have in my life that I want in my life. I've got to get over envy, and I've got to learn how to celebrate the blessings of God on other people. You've heard folks say, when God blesses someone else, you ought to just start praising God because that means he's in the neighborhood. And if he stopped by their house, he might knock on your door the next day. Come through and give you exactly what you were looking for. So we've got to learn how to celebrate the blessings of others. Not envy them, but celebrate them. And then we've got to be honest enough to admit when we got to get rid of slander. So your honesty reveals your growth. And then your humility as you acknowledge that you haven't done all the Lord wants you to do. You're not all you should be. Humility reveals that you're growing. I'm not where I should be. I, I'm not doing what I should do. I'm not walking the walk he wants me to walk. I confess, I acknowledge, I've not grown the way he wants me to grow. I'm not hungering for the word the way I ought to hunger for it. I'm not taking it into my life the way I should. I'm still holding on to malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and slander. So your humility reveals your growth. And then your hunger reveals your growing. You want more word. You want, you're hungry for a more holy life. You hunger for a more godly life. You hunger to be more like Jesus. So your hunger reveals your growth. I'm hungry to be more like the Lord wants me to be. I'm hungry to see more righteousness in the land and in my life. And so your honesty and your humility and your hunger reveals your growth. But then also your heart reveals your growth. Well, how? You, you've got more of a heart for God than you've ever had before. More of a heart for his word. More of a heart for his people. The things of God matter to you more than they've ever mattered before. And then you know saints are growing not only by their hunger and their heart, their humility and their honesty, but by their head. Can you reason with them? Do they listen to counsel? Do they try to obey the word of God? What's in their head when people mistreat them? Malice or slander? Do they want to get even? Or can you talk with them? Can you calm them down? Can they settle down and learn how to do for them others what the Lord has graciously done for them? Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. What's in their head? Will they harbor or will they forgive? What do they think about when they get angry? Are they vindictive? Are they cruel? Are they uncaring? What, what's in their head when things don't go the way they want them to go? Are they at peace? You can tell the saint is growing by what's in their head. But not only that, not only their honesty and their humility and their hunger and their heart and their head, but by their hands. What do they do with their hands? Are they serving the Lord? Are they putting themselves in the will of God? Are they making themselves available to minister and do the work of the Lord? You can tell the saint is growing by their honesty, their humility, their hunger, their heart, their head, and what they do with their Are they working in the vineyard? Do they have a role in the ministry? Are they using their gifts to do anything to glorify the Lord? You can tell they're growing by what they put their hands to. Are they still about the flesh, accumulating things, running after the desires of the flesh? Or are they about the work of God? Just as you can tell that a child that came out of your womb is growing, you can see when someone who's been born again is growing in respect to salvation. I can clearly see my, my precious Blossom, who's Danielle is, no longer the little baby I used to rock to sleep. And my precious can can chocolate cupcake is not that little precious baby I used to rock. No, no, they've grown now. As I can see their growth, 
you ought to be able to see the growth in the life of a believer. I can testify that I have certainly seen saints at Fort Washington grow in the years that the Lord has allowed me to be there with them. This week, we witnessed um, what I, I believe is um, growth in our nation. With, with all the anger and rage that we've witnessed um, when unarmed African Americans have been killed, this week we saw growth. We saw people of every race who were suffering in their hearts because of another murder. We saw them organize themselves. People of every race, every social class, males and females, across age demographics, generations of people from generations older than me to younger than me, we saw them all come together, not only in this land, but even abroad, to express their hurt, their, their pain, that they witnessed and experienced as a result of the murder of George Floyd. We saw growth. We saw all these folk from different backgrounds with honesty that I've never witnessed across social classes cry out that the murder of George Floyd was wrong. At one time in our nation, there were people who would make excuses and allowances for what took place. George Floyd must have done something that merited the officer doing what he done. There would be people who make excuses, protect blue lives. There are people who would make excuses, but not this time. Across the nation, male and female, young and not so young, across ethnic groups, across social classes, with honesty in their heart, cried out this was wrong. Their growth was evident. They had no malice to hurt, but peacefully, with one voice, they marched and they cried out, enough. Black lives matter also. With the hunger for our nation to do right by its citizens of color. They had a hunger that our nation would do right by citizens of color. As one, they marched all over this nation and on foreign soil with hearts concerned about the well-being of those who have suffered injustice too long. And with their hands committed to doing whatever they could to address the moral evils of systematic racism and inequities. And with humility, leaders of organizations like the NFL, Bank of America, Nike, Walt Disney, Uber, Strava, Facebook, the Warner Music Group, and so many others have taken a strong stance against injustice against black people. All saying with one voice, Black Lives Matter also. Vowing to give money to the NAACP and other organizations that fight against moral inequity. And they promise these corporations to change the corporate culture to reflect this paradigm shift in the psyche of America. And to get the point across even more so that all would have no doubt that Black Lives Matter. Mayor Muriel Bowser had it painted on 16th Street leading to the White House and had the street name changed to Black Lives Matter Plaza so that no one would have any doubt the moment they hit 16th Street.
for having overlooked the value and importance of black lives. What a gross step in the heart of America. What growth took place when so many came together to say with one voice, black lives matter also. We witnessed that in America. I'm, I'm grateful for this growth in our nation. I'm grateful that prayerfully we will now see a change in our nation in the attitudes towards people of color. Growth is visible, both in a baby, in a nation, and certainly should be in a saint. We ought to be able to see growth. And prayerfully, it's sustained growth. That we will see that these are beginning steps, not the final steps. We, we trust we'll see that in our nation. There's a, a second thing I wanted to share with you that we're called to do. We're not only called to grow, but I want to bring some things out on this point that I touched last week that I didn't I didn't really squeeze out like I like to squeeze. You know, I like to squeeze all the juice out. I want to squeeze a little more a little more juice out of this text. Um, and that is that saints are called to give God access to their lives in 1 Peter chapter 2. And look at verse 4. Of First Peter chapter two, and, and here's the question: how, how do we how do we give God access to our life? Well, you and I both know that if, if you're going to give, if, if someone's going to have access to your home, they've got to come to your house. If you're going to give God access to your life, you've got to give your you've got to come to Jesus, right? So so there's got to be a muting a meeting of the two: one that's going to allow access, and the other that needs access. So, so, here, so, so you've got to come to Jesus. At verse 4, it says, and coming to him. This is so he can have access. And coming to him, that's to Jesus, as to a living stone. The living stone is Jesus. Coming to him as to a living stone, that's Jesus, which has been rejected by men. You coming to him showed that you did not reject him like other men. Others rejected him, but you came to Jesus. And this is something about this stone, but it's choice and precious in the sight of God. Here's what's significant. How, how do we give God the Lord access? We, we come to Jesus. We give our lives to Jesus as to a living stone. We don't reject him. We receive him. We come to him. We seek him. And this living stone, this Jesus Christ, is precious, valuable in the sight of God. By coming to him, you acknowledge his value. You acknowledge that you see him as God sees him. Valuable, precious. And you come to him, you don't reject him, you receive him into your life, and you allow God now to have access to you. You come to Jesus with arms open, heart open, so that the Lord can work in your life. You don't turn your back. You don't close up your heart. You make yourself available so that the Lord can minister in your life. The first thing you've got to do if you're going to give God access is you've got to come to Jesus. And then what else do you do to give God access? Saints must yield completely to God. So now that you've come, then you've got to yield. He says in verse number five, you also as living stones. The moment now, so look, you also as living stones. Jesus is a living stone. He was rejected by men. He's choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones. That must mean you're also precious in the sight of God. He says you also as living stones are being built up for a spiritual house, for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says, he says, uh, are being built up. You also as living stones are being built up, are being built up, are being built up. The construction project is underway. The construction manager and the one doing the building is God. We're being built up into what? A spiritual house. For what reason? For a holy priesthood. To do what? To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Every saint, male and female, across ethnic groups, is a living stone being placed on this spiritual house that God is building. 
You and I, when we come, we say, Lord, wherever you see I fit on the building, you place me. I relinquish my life to you. You know what's best for me. You know what gifts I have. You know your call on my life. You know what you want me to do. You know what benefit I can add to the body. You place me in this spiritual house where you want me to be. I yield my life to you. I am going to now be a part of a holy priesthood with every other living stone on that building. We are a holy priesthood set apart for God's use to do what? Offer up spiritual sacrifices. People of every race, of every social class, of every political party are in the priesthood. We're a spiritual house of a holy, set-apart priest to God to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now you remember, in the Old Testament, the priest of God would wait at the temple and the people of God would bring a sacrifice, a lamb, a goat, a bull, a ram, to offer up to atone for their sins. They would lay their hands on the animal. The guilt would be transferred from the sinner to the animal. The animal would be slain in their place as a sacrifice, a substitute who would bear the punishment for that person's sins, and the person would walk away having been, if you will, forgiven of their sin because the wrath for their sin had been satisfied on the animal. Well, we don't need to bring another lamb or goat or bull or ram because the lamb that satisfied the sin debt was offered on Calvary, the person of Jesus Christ. However, the ministry of the priesthood still continues. God is building up a holy priesthood to offer sacrifices, not lambs, goats, and bulls, and rams, but spiritual sacrifices, not material things like a lamb, a goat, or bull, or ram, but spiritual sacrifices. What, what, what would classify, what would, uh, what would, and you know, you know, um, if you know me, you know the thing that's always important to me is context, because, you know, um, I, I, you know, I was tempted to first look throughout the New Testament for um, the word sacrifice and see what kind of things fell under sacrifice in the New Testament. And, and but, 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 you know, but, you know, I resisted it. And I said, if Peter wrote this letter to these suffering saints, he would not have written this to them. And then with this in mind that they would have to go to look at Romans or Colossians or Hebrews or some other book in order to figure out what he was trying to say. That would be confusing, right? They didn't have, they didn't have um, Xerox machines where they could just run multiple copies and just send them out. No, no, they, they had to write things by hand. So, so anything Peter would have wanted them to understand about a spiritual sacrifice, he would have had to have included in, in, in the letter. That makes sense to you? Okay. So, so here, here's, here, here's some of the sacrifices I saw that are spiritual that we could offer up to God. The first one is rejoicing or giving praise to God in the midst of suffering. And Peter says that at verse number 6 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So, so rejoicing or giving praise to God is a spiritual sacrifice. This is confirmed in Hebrews 13 and 15 through 16 and Colossians 3 and 16. So that rejoicing or giving praise to God is a sacrifice that I can offer and you can offer. We can give God praise. That's a, a spiritual sacrifice. It's spiritual. It demonstrates that we're spirit led. Then, then there's something else I saw. That living an obedient and holy life is a spiritual sacrifice. It's spiritual. It's right in the sight of God. Chapter 1, 13 through 15, we're exhorted to be obedient. Do not be conformed to the form of lust and to be holy as the Lord is holy. And then, so we can live an obedient life. We can rejoice or praise God. And then in chapter 1 and 22, we're exhorted to love one another. 
So loving someone is a spiritual sacrifice. It demonstrates spirituality. He, you say, say, God, here's what I'm offering up to you, God. I'm going to offer up to you um, for uh, uh, I'm going to offer up to you my love for my brother and my sister. He, he, I'm offering up this. This is his example. This is what I'm giving. My love to my brother and sister. Here's my spiritual act of worship is to love my brother and sister. Here's another sacrifice we can offer up. Preaching the word in chapter 1 and 25. So Lord, as I'm standing right here preaching today, Lord, I'm offering this up to you. I'm trying to bless the people, but it's really an offering to you that you would be pleased with the proclamation of the word while I'm trying to build up the people of God. And then another sacrifice, put away evil, malice, and guile, and hypocrisy. You say, you, say, you know what? I was going to get even with you, but I'm going to make a sacrifice to God. I'm putting it away. I was going to slander you because you did that to me. I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm putting that away, and I'm going to offer myself up to God. I was going to lie. You know what? I'm putting that out of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm making a sacrifice. I'm offering myself up to God. I'm getting that out of my life. And then here's another sacrifice. Abstaining from lust. He says here in chapter number uh, one, he says, Be uh, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. That's a spiritual sacrifice. Abstaining from lust. I was going to go down to the place and do this, this, and this. I was. My mind, I, in my mind, I, I was already there. But you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to offer myself up to God. I'm submitting to authorities is a spiritual sacrifice in chapter 2, 13 to 20. Following the example of Christ is a spiritual sacrifice. Here's a real good one. Wives, submit to your husbands in chapter 3, 1. Say, you know what? You know what, honey? You know what? I wasn't going to do what you asked me to do, but because of the Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a spiritual sacrifice today. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to do what you call me to do, what you asked me to do, what you require. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, here's another one. Husbands, be understanding of your wives. I was going to go off. I was going to cuss. I was going to carry on like a fool. But you know what? I'm going to offer myself up to God, and I'm going to say, Lord, give me understanding. Why is it that my bride wants me to do A, B, and C? I don't see any sense in it. Everything looks fine to me. But you know what? Since she wants it done, I'm going to be understanding. It's a sacrifice. I'm going to do it, Lord. And then don't return evil for evil. So when someone does evil to you, you know what? I was going to get even. I was planning on it. But you know what? I'm going to make a spiritual sacrifice. I'm giving that thing up. I'm putting it away from me. And instead... I'm going to bless you even though you've been cursing me. I'm going to, here's another one. Use your gift to serve one another. Chapter 4 and 10. Sharing the sufferings of Christ. Chapter 4 and 13. And then I saw this as pastor. Sharing the sufferings of God with evenness. Not just to get money, but voluntarily. In chapter 5, 1 through 4. Amen. These are spiritual sacrifices. So, so whoever you're sitting next to, tell somebody, give some spiritual sacrifices this week. I don't know, when I was going through that list, you know, when you look at what you've been giving the Lord lately, what sacrifices you have made, um, have you been giving them praise? Have you been trying to live an obedient life? Have you been loving others? Have you been, well, maybe you've been sharing the word of God. Have you been preaching the word? Have you been putting away evil? abstaining from lust, submitting to authority, following Christ, submitting to your husband, wise husbands, understanding your wives, not returning evil for evil, using your gift to serve one another, sharing the sufferings of Christ. Have you made any spiritual sacrifices this week? Well, you know what? You have a brand new start. After today, you can start making some spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Some people think the spiritual sacrifice is only giving them praise. That's something with your mouth. A lot of you know the Lord is not interested in just your mouth. He wants your whole life. 
He wants you to give yourself. He wants you to make sacrifices in other areas of your life. So uh, here's the third thing. I want to tell you. I want to give you something else. Um, how do we how do we give God access to our life? Um, remember, I told you first, you got to come to Christ. Then you got to yield completely to God, and then you got to believe the scriptures concerning God and Christ. Look, look at um, look at verse number uh, six, verse six of chapter number two. You got to believe the scriptures, and this is profound. He says, um, for this is contained in scripture. Behold, I, that's God. You got to believe the scriptures concerning God and Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I, that's God. Lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. That's Christ. God says, I laid in Zion, that's Jerusalem. I laid there a precious cornerstone. I put Christ there. Christ came because God sent him. And then he says, and he who believes in him, believes in Christ, will not be disappointed. God sent Jesus a precious cornerstone, the first stone on the spiritual house God is building. And we who believe in Jesus become living stones on that building. And we will never be disappointed. What does that mean? How, in what way will we not be disappointed? At verse 24 of chapter 2. Here's how we won't be disappointed. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. That we might die to sin and live the righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. You won't be disappointed. Jesus bore your sins on, in his body on the cross. So that atonement was made for your sins and mine. By his stripes we have been healed. This is good news. You will not be disappointed. What you're looking for from God, forgiveness of sin, has been accomplished through the person of Jesus Christ. Here's something else you won't be disappointed in. In chapter 1, at verse number 8, and though you have not seen him, you love him. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and 8, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you will greatly rejoice with, with joy inexpressible, inexpressible and full of glory. Here's how you won't be disappointed. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. So that you won't be disappointed. You put your faith in Jesus and your soul shall be saved and you shall be forgiven for your sin. All that God has chosen us for shall be realized. You won't be disappointed. At verse 7, look what he writes. This precious value then is for you who, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. This precious value, Christ, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, this precious value is for you who believe. He's the cornerstone with living stones attached to the building. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Those who don't believe in Christ have no idea who they rejected. The stone which the builder rejected, this became the very cornerstone. They have no idea who they rejected. Sometimes, you know, we don't realize who is in our presence. We don't realize sometimes the value of the life that is standing right before us. Sometimes... The life we think we don't need in our life is the very life sent by God of great value in the plans of God for what God wants to do in your life and in mine. We need to be careful about the lives that we reject from our life. That life may have been sent by God to bless your life. They had right before them the one sent by God to bless their life and they rejected it. You need to make sure that you don't reject a life that God sent to be in your life to give your life something that your life needs that God realized you cannot do without. You've got to recognize the value of every life that God puts in your life. The builders, they rejected the cornerstone, the very one sent by God to bless them, to enable them to become all 
that God wanted them to be. Without the cornerstone, they could never build a spiritual house of priests who could offer anything acceptable to God. They needed the very one they rejected. Every stone is placed on the building in relation to the cornerstone. Without the cornerstone, you can't build. The builders, these were Jews, attempted to build the spiritual house without Christ. Instead of rejecting Christ, when they saw Christ, they should have started rejoicing with great joy. Don't reject the one the Lord sent to be in your life that should be a cause of your rejoicing. We've got to learn to recognize whom the Lord has sent to be in our life and start rejoicing. What Peter does is Peter quotes Psalm 118. Having been nourished on the milk of the word, Peter now, when he meets Jesus and sees the ministry of Jesus, looks back at the Old Testament and sees in Jesus truths about Jesus that he had missed before he met Jesus. But after he came to know Jesus, his head revealed his growth. He began to see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. So in Psalm 118, and I won't be able to get too much more uh, today, uh, not too much more, but in Psalm 118, look at what he wrote here. Look, look what David wrote in Psalm 118. Peter saw it um, as a fulfillment of Jesus. At verse 22 of Psalm 118, David wrote, the stone which the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone. And then look what he writes. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord caused the stone to become the cornerstone. That's Jesus. It is marvelous in our eyes. He's a reason for rejoicing, not rejecting. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, Lord, do save, we beseech thee. Oh, Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. How? Through the cornerstone. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. When Jesus got on the donkey going into Jerusalem to be crucified, they shouted, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Drawing from Psalm 118, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us life. That's in Christ. Bind the festival sacrifice with the cords to the, to the horns of the altar. That's bringing the lamb sacrifice to be sacrificed on the altar. Speaking of Jesus, thou art my God, and I give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I extol thee. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When Peter saw Jesus, he saw a fulfillment of all that David wrote in Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. Pointed to the ministry of Jesus, the chief cornerstone, the Lord sending him, the sacrifice he made, the salvation he would bring, the riding in on the donkey. All of this is fulfilled in Christ. You've got to know who's in your presence before you reject the one sent by God to bless your life. They rejected the one they had been waiting for, the very one who would bring salvation to the ends of the earth through the preaching of the gospel of his death and his resurrection. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the cornerstone, the precious stone sent from heaven by God, becomes a living stone added to the house. God acceptable sacrifices to God. And then Peter writes, however, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. For those who disbelieve, he's the cornerstone. You can't build a spiritual house to offer acceptable sacrifices to God without Christ. Call your gathering whatever you want. Call it whatever you want. But if there's no Jesus in your gathering, you can't offer nothing that's acceptable to God. He's the cornerstone. And at verse number 8, he writes, And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. That stumbling literally means to strike against, to describe something that you hit that causes pain, so you pulled away from it. When the builders encountered Christ, they pulled away from him.
because he failed to meet the expectations of a Messiah. He was not like David, a warrior. He was humble, riding on a donkey. They rejected him, pulled away from him. He's a rock of offense, which literally means something that causes someone to fall. It's the word offense there comes from this Hebrew word called scandalon, which we get the word scandal. When they met Jesus, he caused a scandal. What was the scandal he caused? He did not meet their expectations. They did not know whether to believe him or to reject him, to receive him or to reject him. He caused a scandal. He shook up everything. They were looking for someone else. It was a scandal. They didn't know what to do. And so instead of receiving Jesus, they rejected Jesus. It caused them to fall. This scandal that they were in, not knowing whether to believe Jesus or receive Jesus and, or to reject him. And so they rejected him and they fell. They did not recognize the one in their midst. And then here's the reason they really fell. Peter writes, but they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word. What word were they disobedient to? They stumbled because they were disobedient to the word. They pulled away from Jesus because they were disobedient to the word. What word? They disobeyed the word concerning Christ, that he's the living stone, that he's the lamb sent from God to die for the sins of the world. God sent Jesus to die and be resurrected. The word was that Jesus is the lamb who would die for the sins. What word did they disobey? They refused to believe that he is who he said he is. They rejected the command to believe. And as a result, they stumbled, they fell. And Peter writes, and to this doom they were also appointed. Everyone who rejects Jesus is appointed to this doom. What doom? You will stumble and you will fall into judgment. And you will not receive all that God has promised for those he has chosen. My earnest prayer is that upon hearing Christ and hearing the word of God, that you do not reject Christ. Because if you reject him, you will then experience the doom of those who rejected Christ. And that is, they stumbled and fell. And when they stand again, they'll stand in the judgment and be cast away from God for all eternity. That's not our call. We're called to give God access to our lives. Come to Christ, live completely to God. Believe the scriptures, and then obey the scriptures. Believe on Jesus. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, help each one of us give you access to our heart and to our lives. To come to Christ, to yield completely to you, to believe the scriptures, and to obey the scriptures. In Jesus' name. Right where you are, if you've never accepted Christ, just say, Lord, I accept Jesus as my Savior. I believe he's Lord. I believe he's the stone, the cornerstone, the precious cornerstone. And that the house you're building, I want to be one of those living stones on that building. I want to be a part of that holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to you. I receive Jesus. I don't reject him. I accept him as my Savior. I believe he died for my sin. He is the Lamb of God. And through him, I can be forgiven and have eternal life. I love you and I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, know today you are saved and you're now going to be added to the building. Get ready to get to work. Use your gifts to glorify the Lord. Let's hear from Sister Joy and Brother Dendy as you prepare your communion kits. We'll take communion today. Let's hear Psalm 98 from Sister Joy and Brother Dendy. Mm -hmm.
Brother Dindy and Sister Joy uh, made this CD several years ago. And uh, if you'd like a copy of the CD, I'm sure Brother Dindy can make that possible. Frederick Dindy and Sister Joy is singing. It's a beautiful CD. Great songs on it. It will bless your heart if you do so. Let's take our communion now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it reads this way. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord God, we thank you for the bread representing the body of Christ. We partake of it now, Lord, thanking him for being our substitute, bearing the marks on his body that we deserve, taking the punishment upon himself that should have been for us. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. The body of Christ, won't you take and eat? In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Each time we partake of this, we preach the gospel that Jesus lived, died, was resurrected and shall come back again. The blood of Christ poured out for the remission of sin. Let's take and drink together. Thank you so much, people of God. Your presence was a blessing today. I hope the word encouraged your heart. Um, I'm so glad that you on the broadcast have received Jesus, that you are one of those living stones on the building, that together we are one holy priesthood in Christ Jesus. I trust that this week you'll be offering up all kinds of spiritual sacrifices, living holy and submitting to one another and being understanding and offering praise and thanksgiving and all those kind of things. I trust that you will apply this word to your life. I'm so grateful that you have been, not been disobedient and rejected the word to believe on Christ, but you've been obedient. You believe the word of God. Continue to walk with the Lord. Let him use you. Uh, if you'd like to make an offering to our ministry today, you can do so on our fortwashingtonbaptist.org website and go to the GiveLify link and you can bless us with whatever the Lord has moved your heart to bless us with. Uh, if you're a member at Fort Washington, you should have received an email from Evangelist Ware with Zoom links to the various classes, our men's, women's, youth, and a special class today being taught by Deacon McMillan on blacks in the Bible. So make sure you um, log into one of the classes starting at 1015. You'll be glad you did so. I love you and I appreciate you. Thank you so very much again, or I'll see you, Lord's willing, on Wednesday if the creek don't rise. Yes? And we'll jump into our study again and we'll pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. God bless you. I love you. May heaven smile upon you. To our conference call, saints, thank you for being with us today. Your presence is always a blessing. I appreciate you. Bye-bye now.